Hi everybody, I'm with uh, Les Ferdinand, also known as Sir Les. It's going to be a fun show. Uh, I've known Les for a while, and obviously I've seen him as a player for a while. I was just saying to him just before the show when they put all the statistics, wow, you're quite a player. Never realized you were such a good player. 149 goals, 49 assists in 351 Premier League appearances, and current, most important part, Queen's Park Rangers Director of Football and is going to lead us back into the Premier League. 11th, not one, not two, 11 times top Premier League scorer in the charts. That's quite mm-hmm. something. That's quite something. Tell us about your youth, Les. Let's start off there. Did you, did you, at what stage did you think you would be a professional footballer? Was it from a very early age or tell us, tell us what it's like. I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy because I had this conversation with someone the other day, Tony, and uh, the truth is I never, ever thought I was going to be a professional footballer. As a kid, there was, there was no, there was no, there's hardly any black players on the TV that I could aspire to, to think this was an industry that I could go into. Yeah. So I just played football because I loved it. You know, it was, there wasn't a lot else to do um, in terms of sport when you went to school, what it, all it was was football. So, you know, picked up a ball and uh, I used to play with my mates. As I went to senior school, I kind of like went into uh, playing non-league football. Um, we started off at semi-professional levels and and sort of like worked my way up through the ranks in there. And and even then, when I was playing semi-professional football, I loved the idea of playing football. I used to, I used to work and, you know, I, I worked for, I worked in a steam cleaning place. I worked doing painting and decorating. I used to go Tuesday, Thursday training in the evening um, and then play on a Saturday and Sunday as well. Yeah. So I used to do all that, but just for the love of it, never believing I was going to be a professional footballer. Were you always a striker? It's really funny. When I was at school um, and I played in the school team, I played I played as a goalkeeper. <laughs> because, and, and, and the truth of the matter, time, the, the only time I ever went to a football game, right, a, a professional football game, live football game, was Queen's Park Rangers. I went and watched Queen's Park Rangers. Never forget, I played against Leicester. Right. And Phil Parks was in goal. Right. I stood in the loft. Oh, wow. And, and I remember sort of, I was so impressed with Phil Parks in goal. He, he played in goal on the day, had no gloves on. And I was like, wow, man, I want to be a goalkeeper. I want to be a goalkeeper. <laughs> How old were you? And, and the, How old were you? I, I would have been around pro- probably about 11, 12. All oh, right. And then um, and so I said I wanted to be a goalkeeper, and that was it. I was like, you know, I started. I, I called myself the cat. I went in goal, called myself the cat, and I was springing all over the place. I played in goal for the school team, but I used to play five sides on a Friday night. And some of the guys I used to, that used to play in my school team play used to play in these five sides. Right. And then one day the goalkeeper, uh, the, the centre forward for our school team got injured, and and boys that I played with said to the the, the schoolmaster, "Well, let's can play up front." And we've got a reserve goalkeeper. We haven't got a reserve centre forward. Right. So I played up front. I scored a hat trick, and and the schoolmaster said to me, "You're never playing goal for this team again." <laughs> and that was it. Your first hat trick was it with your feet or your head or both? It was my feet. All of all the goals were with my feet because yeah. back then, all we all all as 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 young players, all we all we ever did was watch the Brazilians. Right. When the World Cup came around, and we all wanted to be Brazilian, so yeah. Brazilians never used to score with their head. Yeah. So they was, they, you know, was everything was your feet. Do you think the work ethos has changed? I mean, it's it's fascinating to hear. Or oh, were you an exception in those days as well? You know, to stay out there and prove and go out there. You got to work hard, right? My my ethos is there are no shortcuts. You you've yeah. got talent, as we've seen so many players with talent, but then they lose it for a whole lot of other reasons. But talent is nothing without working hard. Do you think that's changed in the modern day game or do you still see players who want to work hard like, you know, and coaches who are prepared to go out there? It's always one of the things I, I notice that any football club past a certain time, everyone's gone. Yeah. And, you know, and a day gone by West Ham and stuff, you'd see people still training really late in the evening, actually. Yeah, afternoon, evening. Yeah. I think that's, that's changed to a degree, time, and I think Is that medical. More because of they brought sports science <clears throat> and those sort of things into the game. Yeah. Back, 
back in the day, you trained and trained until you felt I'd done enough. Yeah. Whereas sports science now, they all the boys go out, and you've seen it, Tom. They have these, uh, they have these look GPS monitors yeah. on them, and they say, right, you've done X amount of running today, and you've done X amount of this, that, and the other, and this is the level you need to be at. If you go beyond that, you're going to fatigue yourself. <laughs> People staying out in the afternoon and doing <laughs> an extra hour, you you give the players an excuse not to do it. Yeah, you know, and I and I always argue there's exceptions to the rule. I said because you know, you know Ronaldo, who is arguably the best player in the world for his longevity and what he's done. Yeah, at the moment, you know, like, you know we talk about Messi and Mbappe and all those guys, but Ronaldo now has been consistently up there for as many years as I can remember. Yeah, and if you anyone that's worked with Ronaldo will say to you. He's the first person there in the morning and the last person to go home. He works tirelessly to make sure he can stay in the, in, 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 in the condition, in the, in, in the place that he is right now. So when you see that, I often argue with our sports scientists and I go, well, you know, you say this, this and this, but look at Ronaldo. He's the best player in the world or one of the best players in the world. And it's right for him. So why isn't it right for our players who are not the best players in the world but <laughs> would aspire to want to be yeah, the best players in yeah. the world? Do you think you'll see more Asians in in the game? Is it you know? Yeah, or... I, I certainly do, and I'm surprised that we're not seeing we're not seeing more already. Yeah. So the way things have changed. Yeah, there was a stereotypical um, thought process years ago that you know, it's almost like black can guys be... can't head. Everyone thinks right, right. Asians can't, can't play yeah, football. You know, they go to the cricket the, pitch. You know, was Asian, you wanted to play cricket rather yeah. than football. You yeah. know? But I think that, you know, that myth's changed. And we, 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 you know, we've, we've got some Indian boys in the academy and, yeah. and then they are taking an interest in football, you know, and... Um, yeah, we I have think, a player playing for Sri Lanka. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so... Um, yeah, Van Rick. Van Rick. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is changing, um, but it's taking too long to change. Did you know... Rio and Anton at a young age? No, growing up, I, I, I didn't know them. I, I, it was, again, it was... Really everyone everyone assumes, up. just like Acton, everyone assumes you all played football together. Of yeah, course, I know you no, didn't, but tell the story. You know, it's really strange. When I was when I was at QPR, at one stage, we we, we, tra- we used to train at um, a place called Hangar Lane. Yeah. Uh, we, we used to, to rent the fields off Barclays Bank. And we used so to you really are a West London boy, actually, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Southall, yeah, Acton, Ladbrook Grove, yeah. Hangar yeah, anywhere, anywhere, anywhere South East or, uh, or North, I never used to go. Yeah. And, uh, it was always West London. So, <laughs> yeah, we used to train in um, Hangar Lane. And one one Sunday, I, I, I picked up an injury on a Saturday. And, and one Sunday, I went to um, I went to the training ground to, for treatment. And while I was here, this this little kid comes running over to me in the QBR kit, and he says, "I'm your cousin." <laughs> and I was going, "Well," he says, "I'm your cousin. My name's Rio." <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, okay." And so all of a sudden, his, his dad was with him. His dad come over, and a lot of people don't know that Rio played for for QBR's youth team. Yeah, was, I, I didn't he, know that actually. He was, at, he was at a QBR as a kid. Yeah. And so his dad came over and, and he, I started talking to his dad and he said, yeah, yeah, we're related. He said, um, my granddad and Rio's granddad were brothers. Wow. So that was the connection. So, um, and we, we'd never met. We'd never that's met. A, that's incredible, that's like, isn't it? I started, I, started, I started talking to his dad and we, we had a conversation and so on and so forth. The next time I saw Rio, he was playing, he was at West Ham. He was taller than me. And he was this this reputation about him going, going on to be this great great footballer, and, I, and then I started to see him, and I was like, "Wow, Jesus!" You know, what I mean, last time I saw you, you was you was up to my waist, and now you're taller than me, and you you, you, you know you're on the verge of becoming this this great footballer. So let's just let's keep keep back on that. I just want to focus because I want to want to give some kind of inspiration to, to the kids. So you're playing non-league football. Mm-hmm. How did you get that professional contract? What was it like? You know, who spotted you, and where did yeah. you go? Like I said, Tony, what, what I did was um, when I was playing football and even to my kids now, I speak to them and about anything you do in life. I played football because I loved it. I didn't think oh, oh, I'm going to be a professional footballer because it's going to give me a nice lifestyle. It's going to give me a nice car. It's going to give me nice watching. I just played football because I loved playing football. And I used to commit myself to, to, to training on a Tuesday evening and, you know, I was working, you know, eight hours a day and then I was jumping on two, a train and two buses to get to training. And 
doing the reverse to go home again, but just for the love of it. Uh, and like I said, I played non-league football. And that's where I thought my, my career was going to be in non-league football too. And I was aiming to play at the highest level I could at non-league football. Mm. And then I, I played at Southall at 17, um, managed to play at Wembley when we when I was 18 in the VARS, the FA VARS final. Oh, wow. And I always, and I always remember sitting at um, sitting in the, in the changing rooms before the game and the manager said to all of us that were sitting in there, he said, look, one of you may have the opportunity to come here and play at Wembley again at some stage in your in your life, whether it be in the trophy final, whether it be in the Vars final, make sure you you savour this opportunity because most of you will never get the opportunity again. Yeah. And every single one of us was looking around the the the, the, the changing rooms <laughs> thinking, who who could that be? I wonder who might come back. And I was look we had some really good players in the sign off. And I got the opportunity, you know, I was told that a few clubs were looking at me. And I'd I'd heard that throughout my time in non league football that clubs were looking at me. Yeah. And then I went from Southall to, to Hayes and I still, you know, m- my manager at the time at a football club said to me, my dad came to a final, we, 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 we had a final and my dad came to the final and, and, and my coach said to him at the time, he said, your boy's got a lot of talent. He said, but I'm not sure he takes football as seriously as he should. And I always remember my, my, my dad saying to me, why don't you give it the best shot you've got? And I said, What's, what do you mean? He said, well, why don't you give a year of absolutely devoting yourself to, to, to football yeah. or even two years, devote yourself to football and see what happens. And if you, if you, if you don't become a professional footballer, at least you said you, you've given it your best shot and it's not worked out. So I said, okay. So what I did, I made sure I was on, at training on time every single Tuesday, Thursday and on uh, on the Saturday. And within six months, I was, I, I signed for, for QBR. Tell me what it was like. I mean, when did you hear who was the scout? And uh, how much were you paid? We Make- was um, there was a play uh, a fellow called Bobby Ross, who um, he used to work at uh, in in Hammersmith. Uh, he used to work at a, a club called the Soulgrave Club, which was a, a local boys' club. But he also used to scout for QPR. Yeah, and there was a, there was a couple of people in that Soulgrave Club who said, you know, QPR don't really support the local community back in the, in in the, in, the, in the day. And he said, what do you mean that? He said, well, we got talented players, you know, playing all over the place. But he said, well, tell me where one is. And my mate mentioned to him that Mick and myself playing at, at Southall, so, uh, sorry, playing at Hay. So he said, well, I'll go and watch. So he came to, he came to watch, apparently, and, you know, this is what he tells me. He came to watch and he was like, wow, yeah, this boy's got something. Yeah. So he went, he went back to the club and he said, look, I've, I've watched it. I've seen this boy at Hayes. I think he's got a lot about him. I think we should monitor him pretty much like we do here and now at yeah, QBR. Yeah. So he came to watch a couple of times and then Frank Sibley came to watch. Then Peter Shreves and they all went back with, with glowing reports. And um, then the, the manager himself, Jim Smith, who was the manager of the QBR oh, yeah. at the time, came yeah. to watch me and said, yeah. And it was really funny because the day that I, um, Jim Smith got came to watch me, um, I got sent off. I used to have a little bit of a fiery temper and um, I got into a little bit of an altercation yeah. and um, I got sent off. But he said he liked that fire in my belly yeah. and um, and they signed me. And, you know, I was as surprised as everybody else at the time um, because, like I said, I thought I'd um, lost my chance for getting sent off. And um, yeah. but no, he was pretty impressed with that. Who told you we're going to sign you up? Because you oh, didn't have the, an agent, assume, presumably. No, I didn't have, didn't have any agent. What happened was the Q, uh, QPR made contact with with Hayes. I'd signed a contract at Hayes. Right. And QPR made a, 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 a made a deal with, with Hayes. Bought me for £30,000. Big money then, even then, actually, for Hayes. Yeah. Well, they well yeah, they for, for coming out of non-league, that was big money. Yeah. But then what they had was a 10% sell-on. Oh, wow. Any future sell on. Wow. So obviously when I left QBR and went to, to Newcastle for six million, they got yeah. the, the six hundred grand. <laughs> How long did they sign you on at QPR? They signed me on, I think it was a three year contract with a year's option. And what was your first wage? Probably I think if I remember correctly, so it was probably three hundred quid. Jesus Christ. Three <laughs> That's really irritating back, to hear. That, three hundred pounds for Les Ferdinand. <laughs> Back in 1987. Where did you sign at Loftus Road? Yeah, I went to Loftus Road, yeah. and it was really, it was really funny because I was, I was 
working for this uh, painting and decorating firm yeah. um, at the time. And I had to, I had to, I had to work a month's notice. <laughs> Right? Are you serious? Uh, and so I'm a, I'm a, I'm an honourable guy. Yeah. But I didn't just say to them, right, now nah, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a professional footballer. I'm done. I said, look, I've got a month. I've got to do a month. And I always remember. I, 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 I salute you for that. I really do. That's that's right. why I love you. That is and, class. So you kept painting. Did, sorry? You, were, you kept painting for a month. I, was, I kept doing my job for, a, I'll tell you what happened. I kept doing my job and then, my very first game for QBR, I, I had to take a day off work and I said to them, look, I've got a game tonight at Southampton. <laughs> you mean right? first team? My, no, it was my, my uh, reserve game. Oh, my right. very first game, my very first reserve game for QBR yeah. it was QBR versus Southampton. So I had to meet at Loftus Road and we got a coach and we went down to, um, we went down yeah. to Southampton. Les, what was it like though when you signed? I mean, was it like, wow, you know, my, my first professional contract or do you just take it in? As another day, uh, it was. Um, I, I kept thinking to myself, someone's going to wake me up in a minute. First debut for QPR first team. Yep. When was that? I was. Pl- I played. I came on. I was on. So I was a sub against. So I came in the back end of. I got to QPR around about March time. Mm-hmm. So there was a couple of months go to to go before the end of the season. I played in a few reserve games and I was scoring in the reserves. And then um, Jim Smith put me on the bench against Coventry. It was the 1987. It was a year that Coventry won the FA Cup. Oh, yeah. So, so they Terry were Terry Yorath, was it? Sorry? Terry Yorath. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Terry yeah. Yorath. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they was very, um, they were poignant. They had Sir Regis up front. And I, you know, Sir Regis Sir had Regis come out. Is of, God. Yeah, he was, you know, was and he'd come out of, um, he'd come out of Hayes as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, did he go to I West Brom after, in, or was he? Was he? Did he go to West Brom Street? after? Did he go to West Brom after? Uh, no, he was West Brom first, and, and then, then he Coventry. and then he went to then he went to Coventry. But when he was at Coventry, he was now very, very much established as a, as a player. And I always remember, so like looking at him in the tunnel and looking at the size of him and <laughs> seeing him run on the pitch, and I was thinking, how am I ever going to get to that? <laughs> You know, I was yeah. just in awe of seeing this geezer run around the, the, the pitch and people bounce off him and he scored on the day and I was like, I remember that was that was my debut. That was my um my debut as a as a as a as a young man coming on into the pitch. We were three one down and we ended up we ended up losing the, the, the game three one. I never I never scored. My actual first team debut was against my first start was against Everton at Goodison Park. My Loftus Road debut, where I started the game at Lost- Loftus Road, I managed to score two goals against Chelsea. Oh, wow. What a debut that would have been. Do you remember every goal? No. 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 Um, because you seem to really- have a very vivid memory of, 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 of most of the games. And in, in times when I talk to you, 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 you've got a pretty damn good memory. What it is, is if someone prompts me and says to me, oh, do you remember the goal against, and they tell me the team, yeah. then I'll go, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember doing that and I remember doing this and so yeah. on and so forth. I'm sure this is a cliche question, but i got to ask you, what is the most favourite goal you've ever scored? Wow. Wow. So there's, there's different, I think there's different goals for different reasons, you know, yeah. when people say to me, you know, I mean, when I when I think back, you know, I scored a a, a thirty yarder at, at, at QPR against Man United, and this was when you know teams were courting me at the time, and you know uh, it was live. And w- what what stands out for me was like I, Paul Lynch was a good friend of mine, yeah. And and we were, we were playing for England together, and he went to me, and what we used to do was every, whenever we played against each other, we tried to smash each other, and he'd go, he said, wait till like he said, wait till you get on the ball, I'm going to smash you, and I was like, yeah. okay, no problem. And I managed to kind of like slip the ball past him yeah. and turn and hit it, yeah. And it went in the top corner, and I went, yeah, smash that. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, so you know, we, we, and there was always banter going on on yeah. the pitch while we while we were playing. So that stick that sticks out of one of my my, my favourite QBR goals. I scored a goal at um at Luton for QBR. Um, on when they had the plastic pitch. Oh yeah. Um, we were down to bare bums, and myself and Bradley Allen played. All the strikers, Roy Wigley, Colin Clark, Mark Falker, were all injured. So myself and Bradley Allen played, 
and I scored a, a, head, a, a header and I scored a goal where I picked the ball up on a halfway line, beat a few and scored and we, we won the game 2-1. That sticks out in my mind. My first goal for, for Newcastle, when I went to um, when I went to Newcastle, you know, on, on my debut, I managed to score, and I knew the number nine was a real special number up at Newcastle. Still is, and it always will be, be because of the people that have worn it in the past. And everyone was, you know, everyone was like wanting me to do well. And when I scored that goal, I kind of like realised what the number nine meant because the place just erupted. So that that sticks out in my mind, you know, going to Tottenham and, you know, as a, as a kid, I, I, I was, you know, and I, I was a Tottenham, an armchair Tottenham fan. Right. So scoring right. scoring the first goal I did at, at, at White like Hart Lane for, for Tottenham it sticks out in my mind. And, yeah. you know, so and I'll, I'll come off this call and I'll go, oh, damn, why didn't I mention that? I'm going to ask Vic uh, to come in. He's a Newcastle fan. He's one of the few Malaysians who actually know where Newcastle is. And, 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 and he actually has a wall, uh, and I've seen it. We 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 play FIFA. He, Vic is an AirAsia AirAsia All Star, and in one of the one of the times we did an interview, actually with Patrick Clivert on something else, uh, I saw he had a huge wall of Newcastle pictures with Les Ferdinand very prominently featured. And this is kind of a dream come true for him. So, over to you, Vic. Hi Les, hi Les. Nice, nice, um, nice listening to you. Uh, listening to all your football stories and all that stuff. Um, one question I want to ask: You mentioned the number nine shirt. So when Ellen Shearer came in and asked for the number nine shirt, what went through your mind first? Uh, <laughs> nice to speak. Nice to, it was nice. It was nice speaking to you, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was it was really weird. We was we was actually going on a on a tour of. We went to Singapore, China, and. Where else did we go? Thailand. And uh, we got to the airport and we'd all checked in and, and, and uh, I kind of like rushed up the escalators because I thought I'd better load up in duty free. And as I jumped, got to the top of the escalators, Terry McDermott, who was the, the assistant manager at uh, at uh, Newcastle at the time, came running up. He said, Les, Les, the uh, manager wants to see you. Kevin wants to see you. So I said, yeah, well, get him to come and see me in duty free. He, you know, I'll chat with him there. He was, no, 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 he needs to see, he might not be getting on the plane. So I went to him, what? He said, yeah, he might not be coming. He wants to see you downstairs. Oh, I was like, tell him, man, I've got to get some duty free. So he's like, <laughs> Les, Les, nah, come. So anyway, I went back down the escalators and, he was, and, and, and Kevin was waiting in this little like, alcove just, to, just in the airport. And he said to me, um, he said, look, I'm going to do something's going to happen today, and I just want to, I want you to be the first to know. So I said, "What's that?" He says, "Um, we're gonna I'm going to try and sign Alan Shearer. It's going to be a, a world record fee uh, for a British player, and I'm going to bring him to the club. And the one thing that's going to happen is because I bring him, people are going to think that you're going. I want you to know that you're not leaving." He said, "I'm not trying to do this to prove anybody wrong. I just believe that you two can play together." I said, "Okay." I said, brilliant. I said, I feel great for us. I said, we were close to winning the league last year. I think adding Allen to it will help us get across the line. He went, brilliant. He said, good, good attitude. And I went, cheers, I'm going to go and do it. He went, oh, just one other thing. So I said, what's that? <laughs> so he said to me, um, he's asked, could he, he wear the number nine shirt? And I said, and what did you say? And he said, well, I said I'd ask Les. <laughs> He said, and the reason I, I said I'd ask you is because he's worn it all in his career and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, so have I. And he said, oh, right. I didn't feel like, I didn't, I didn't uh, think it meant that much to you. And I went, well, hang on a minute. When I came to the club, you was so adamant that I needed to wear the number nine shirt. How could you think it didn't mean much to me? He said, well, look, I was at, I was at um, Liverpool. And he said, I was given the number seven shirt, but it never meant nothing to me. I just wanted to play for Liverpool. I said, great, is that why you wear a, a seven on your chain? <laughs> and he said to me, um, he went, well, you know, I said, listen, listen. And all the time um, I was talking like that, I was just calculating in my head and I was thinking, Alan Shearer coming back to, to Newcastle, big Geordie fan, he's, he, you know, he watched him as a kid. My thought process at the time was the majority of supporters would probably want Alan Shearer to be in the number nine shirt. I didn't want to cause a problem. And I said, to, all I said to Kevin was, look, if you think it's the right thing to do, give him the number nine shirt. So you're the manager of this football club. The mere fact that you've come and asked me the question tells me that you want him to have it. So if that's what you want, that's what you got to do. Very cool. 
And what shirt did you end oh, up with? Ten. You were number ten. Ten. And yeah, but the, 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 number crazy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the crazy thing was there was all sorts of rumours going on. When I when I when I when I when I left and I went, we went to Malaysia and everyone it, we signed Alan and he was given a number nine shirt. I mean, all the players in the team at the time, David Ginola, Lee Clark, who was a Geordie as well, went, what'd you give up the number nine for? You, you, you should have sold it. You should have sold it to him. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have just given it to him. You should have sold it. <laughs> no, no, no. So Lee Clark, who was a really good friend of mine, he was actually my neighbour in um, in um, in Newcastle. He he was the number 10. And he went to me, better not be taking my shirt, Les. I went to Clark, of all the shirts in, I said, of all the shirts in Newcastle, the one shirt I will not take is the number 10. And you did. So I went to, no, what I did is I went to, um, I went to the kit man. Yeah. And I said to him, what shirts are available, Tomo? And he said to me, there's 21, 23. Uh, and then he went through some numbers. It, there was some in the teens as well. And I said to him, 23, Michael Jordan, boom, that's me. Yeah. Give me the number 23. So he went, no problems, I'll get that sorted. So he went back to the, he went back to Kevin Keegan and said, oh, Les wants the number 23. So then all of a sudden, I get Keegan pulls me when we're on tour and he says, look, I know you've asked for the number 23, but the board have said they want you to have a number between 1 and 11. And I said, well, you go back and tell the board I had a number between 1 and 11. You decided to take it off me. <laughs> so um, so uh, he did that. And um, he, he, then he came back and he said, look, the board have said Sunderland have come in and it they, they, looks like they're going to sign Lee Clark. So the number 10 is going to be available. And that's how I ended up in the number 10. Got the number 10. Lee Clark didn't go to, to Sunderland. Oh, so you can imagine for a couple of weeks, <laughs> as was, I got into the lift with him in the morning, <laughs> as, I, as I got into the lift with him in the mornings, there was no conversation. <laughs> there was plenty of good mornings from me, but like nothing coming back from him. But no, he was he was brilliant about it. Yeah. Keegan, was he, what was he like as a manager? I really, I, I really, really enjoyed playing for him. And I thought in terms of, motivation in getting players up for for a game. I thought he was brilliant. He was one of the best I worked with. Tactically, you know, I think everybody knows who supported Newcastle, who knows Newcastle. Our our tactics were you score two, we'll score three. Yeah. You score three, we'll score four. That was the entertainers, wasn't it? Yeah, which doesn't always work. You know, when it does work, <laughs> it's fantastic. You know, I used to come back to London when I was there and people used to say to me, I ain't a Newcastle supporter, but let me tell you something now. Whenever they're on the box, I watch because I know there's going to be goals, <laughs> which was nice. But at the same time, I think if we'd had a bit of tactics about us, we would have gone on and gone on to win the league. But it was it, we were too we were too expansive, expansive. we were too open. Yeah. Great as a centre forward, but yeah. if you're going to win things, you just need you need a little bit of structure. And I, I felt that's probably where we where where he lacked a little. Why did you go and loan to Turkey? Well, basically, I wasn't I wasn't getting into the team at, at QPR at the time, and this opportunity had came come around. And I think Gordon Mill, who was the then manager of the side Besiktash in, in Turkey, had spoken. He, he was good friends with Jim Smith, and he said, "Look, I need a centre forward. We were close to winning the league last year, and uh, you know I think if we can get a centre forward." And Jim Smith said, "Look, we've got a young kid here who we think has got a great future, but we're not quite sure which way it's going to go." Yeah. So. Going to Turkey might, and, and, you know, going to play for you for a year might might just take him to where he needs to be. In the end, I, I decided to go, and it's probably the best decision I've ever made in my life. In, in my footballing life, in that it um, it taught me how to be a professional footballer. I mean, what was it like playing with Shearer? I mean, you, know, you played with him for I think two seasons um, at Newcastle, one season at Newcastle, and then didn't have that many opportunities to play with him in England, but. Your time with him at Newcastle, what was it like? Yeah, I mean, we was. It, we, it, he tells a story, and I often tell the story as well. Um, we used to stand on the centre circle uh, before a game, before kickoff. We used to look at each other and we say, "Shall we terrorise him today?" <laughs> I remember the look you gave each other in the centre circle. I think from, from the yeah, we always used to do. We stand in we stand in centre circle. We go, "Are you terrorising today?" No, I'll come in. Like that. And so, um, you know, he was. Arguably one of the, the, the uh, you know, when people say to me, who's the best centre forward you've played with? It's, it's, it's Alan Shearer. When you were signed by Newcastle, how, how did you feel? You know, you, you've been in West London. Yes, you had the break. You were immensely popular at 
Loftus Road, you're West London boy, you know, going up to Newcastle, different language. <laughs> but but it, what did it feel like? And was that the only club that that no that no I'm really sure good. came so in for you, right? Sorry, I'm sure others were in for you as well. Yeah, but basically, what had happened was I'd always said the only time to leave QBR was when I felt like I I hadn't improved in the season. Mm. Uh, and when I say that, I left QPR in my last season, having scored 26 goals in all competitions in yeah. that year. And so it was probably my best goal scoring season I'd had it at QPR. But I just felt I hadn't, I hadn't advanced as a player, and I'd, I'd become comfortable in where I was. Jerry Francis, had, Jerry Francis had left, and I think you know I've told the story before. During the season, Man United had come in. And, and, and tries to take me uh, during the season. And I was, I was made, it was made, it was made known to me that Man United had come in and they said to me, you need to go to the club now and say, look, I've done my time here. Man United have come in, you know, I want to go. And so what I did, I spoke to the chairman and I said to him, look, I, I do understand that Man United have come in. He said, how did you find out? I said, well, one of the secretaries had told me, and he went to me, which one? I said, well, I ain't going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to lolly her up. But, um, <laughs> he said, yeah, the truth is the matter is they have come in. And what they've said to us is they've tried before. And in the past, we've told them it can only be done at the end of the season. And, and they were, they wanted it for now. And I, I always remember because it was December. And um, what they wanted to do, they needed to sign me before the end of December. So I was able, I was eligible to play in the second part of the Champions League for them. So um, they said, you can't tell us this time around that it's going to be at the end of the season because we need him for now. So basically what happened was, I spoke to the chairman, the chairman said to me, okay, do you want to go? And I said, look, I think I've been loyal here and I think I've done everything you've asked of me. I think, you know, it's Man United. Yeah, of course I want to go. So he said to me, um, <laughs> he said, okay. He said, let me speak to the manager. So he went, Jerry Francis was the manager at the time. He spoke to Jerry. And, and Jerry will tell you this. Jerry speak, you know, Jerry's often told this story. He spoke to Jerry and he said to Jerry, you know, keep Man United have come in for Les. Les knows about it. Les wants to go. And he says, if Les goes, I go. So um, Richard Thompson said, what? He said, I go. So he goes, um, well, he said he wants to go. Jerry resigned. Oh, wow. Right. So Richard Thompson comes back to me and he says to me, Got some good news and some bad news. <laughs> so what's the good news? He says, well, there's no good news really. He said, because I can't lose my manager and my star striker in the same in the same week. Yeah. They said he said, but leave it with me and I will um I'll come back to you. So I said, okay. He said, I might be able to resolve this. I said, okay, no problem. So he comes back to me and he says to me, um, I've got some good news and some bad news. And the good news was that Ray Wilkins, who'd been our captain, had been a, a great servant to, to QBR in, in the way that he played. And he changed the mentality of a load of the players that we had at the football club. Uh, he'd moved on to Crystal Palace. But Richard Thompson felt he would be the ideal replacement for um, from Jerry. And the fans loved Ray. So yeah. he went and got Ray. And Ray was the one who called me and told me about Manchester United's interest. And he said he'd just been in a conversation with um, Alex Ferguson for over an hour. And he all he wanted to speak about me. He said he didn't need to know about my football. It was just about my character. Because unfortunately, what happens in, in London, the press in London always writes that if you're from West London, you don't want to go north. You don't want to go, you know, anywhere yeah. but stay south, you know. Yeah. So, and that was a lot of the rumours that, you know, all the clubs in, 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 in London were in for me and I didn't want to go north. So he wanted to know what sort of type of character I was. And Ray said, I gave him a glowing report, blah, 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 blah. blah. And, and Ray's words to me was, uh, or, or I should say the late Ray Wilkins, his words to me were, when the greatest team in the land come calling, you have to go, Yeah, is what he said to me. So I said, okay. Fair so cop, anyway, man. Chairman comes back and he says to me, um, got some good news and some bad news. I said, what's <laughs> the good news? He said, the good news is I've managed to persuade Ray Wilkins to come back as manager. So I said, okay. So I said, what's the bad news? <laughs> he went, he has only coming back on the condition that they keep you to be able to see <laughs> So obviously Ray, Ray comes in and my first conversation with him is, Ray, you've you've told me about Man United. You told me the best team in the land comes calling. Yeah. You've got to go. He said, okay. 
He said, yeah. And he said, I've taught you another very important lesson in life. I said, what's that? He said, you look after number one first. <laughs> good man. He was and a then, good man. And then sort of like um, it, it, it materialised. And, and even Kevin Keegan told me this story. Uh, and Andy Cole has told me this story as well. And he, he, he said, <coughs> one afternoon, he said, one evening, he said, he, he, he was leaving the ground and he says to Andy, he says to Andy Cole, he sees Andy Cole, he says, where are you going? He says, nowhere. He says, come with me, I'm going to watch a game. So Andy says, where are you going? He says, I want you to come with me, I want you to watch a game. So he comes, he, he jumps in the car with Keegan. Keegan drives him to, to Everton with QBR are playing Everton. And I play and I score and I, I play pretty well. I always used to score against Everton. And so he says to, he says to Andy Cole, that's the centre forward you need to be. And that's the centre forward I'm going to bring to play with you. So he went, OK. He said, yeah, I'd love to play with Les. So Andy tells, and Andy tells this story as well. So anyway, they go back to Newcastle and um, Kevin Keegan called Man United for Keith Gillespie. Oh, yeah. Right. And I don't, remember, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in the day, I, I think Andy Cole went through a period and, and I think he went, he went, they were playing Crystal Palace. And the, the team had travelled down, Newcastle travelled down, and he got into some sort of like dispute with Keegan. And when the game was played, there was no Andy Cole. When yeah, everyone was going, yeah. what's happened to Andy Cole? Yeah. And blah, 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 blah. So anyway, um, that was the start of their the demise for Andy at, uh, at Newcastle. And so anyway, they had a conversation. And Andy Cole, uh, it, like, as I said, Keegan called Man United for Keith Gillespie. Yeah. And then Alex Ferguson said, I'll give you Keith Gillespie if you give me Andy Cole. That's how the conversation went. Wow. Belie not believing that he would get Andy Cole no way, no how, because Andy yeah. Cole was firing for, for Newcastle at the time. Yeah. And then Keegan said to him, make me an offer. So he said, the phone went silent for a while. And then Ferguson said to him, Are you being serious? And he went, yeah, make me an offer. And that's how the Andy Cole uh, wow. to make United wow. deal came about. And so I ended up going to Newcastle. But as you uh, you asked the question with our other teams, Aston Villa were the first team to bid the asking price of six million. Mm. And then Newcastle, Kevin Keegan knew I was going to speak to Aston Villa. <laughs> and it's really strange because I was on my way to Aston Villa. Kevin Keegan calls my agent and says, Well, let's do do me the will he just do me a favor of speaking to us before he makes a decision. So I was like, Yeah, of course. And he said, don't stay at Aston Villa too long. He, I always remember him saying, he said, don't, don't be in the office too long, he goes, because when you come out, the wheels won't be on your car any longer. <laughs> right, so, 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 okay. So I always remember going into, uh, and, and the late Doug Ellis was the, the chairman yeah. of, um, of Aston Villa at the time, and he brought me into his office and we sat there and he was talking and I was thinking, you know, for me, Aston Villa was going to be a sideways step for, for me yeah. because yeah. Or, as, as big a club as Aston Villa was, they were, you know, QBR had finished higher than them in the league the, the, the previous season. So for me, it was a sideways step rather than somewhere where I felt like I was going to go and improve myself. <laughs> I would remember sort of like being in his office and I was sitting there with my agent and he was going around and around and around. And he went to me, um, what, what kind of wages are you looking for? So I looked at my agent and I said, can we have a discussion? So I said, yeah. So he went, I said to my agent, look, let's just say a silly, crazy number and just blame out the just blow out the equation, he'll go, don't be stupid, get out of my office. So he said, at the time, we, we asked for, I mean, this was in 94, 95. I said to him, I said, let's ask for something crazy. So I said, let's ask for £30,000 a week back then. And I said, he'll say, get out of my office, you idiot. So we, we went back in and, and, and the agent went, well, it's got to be at this level. And he went, are you not nuts? And we went, no, nah, we think it's quite fair. And he went, all right, if I give you that money, will you sign here today right now? <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> this weren't supposed to happen. <laughs> so he turned around, he said to me, um, so we went in the office, I said, I said oh, listen, I have to go and discuss this with my, my, my partner and, and stuff like that. And he said, normally, as, and, and I, I, I promise you, he couldn't have, he couldn't have been any more accommodating. I think at the time they had a policy that all players had to leave within, live within six miles of the, the ground and six miles of the, the training ground. Right. And he said, what we'll do, we'll allow, we'll allow you to still live in St. Albans. 
mm-hmm. and you could travel. Right. You could do this, you could do that. He, everything I needed, he gave me. <laughs> so I was going, I just need to go could discuss it with my partner. And he was going, what do you need to discuss? We've given you everything you want. She doesn't have to move. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. In the end, I said, look, no, I, I need to go and discuss it. And he said, well, let me say something to you now. You walk out this door, that deal ain't on the table anymore. And I said, okay, that's the chance I have to take. So I, I walked out of there. I went to um, I went to meet Kevin Keegan. And we, we sat in a hotel. We started talking. And within five minutes, it weren't, it probably weren't even five minutes. Uh, we, I told him what the, we told him what the offer was from um, from Aston Villa, and he went, "Listen, we can get, we can't get anywhere near that." He said, "If it's about the money, then you're going to go." But what I can tell you, this is what Newcastle is going to offer you. It's going to go do, 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 do. within five minutes. I went, "No problem." Shook his hands. I said, "I'll be on my way." Just tell me what time I got to be there. Like, you know what I mean? and that was it. That's it. What's up for Newcastle? Fantastic. How does a player get a call up? When's the first time you knew you were called up, and how did it feel? I've been playing quite. I've been playing very well for Cuba. Um, I'm scoring goals on a regular basis. Um, and at the time, though, there was there was a lot of strikers around who were scoring goals, and and sometimes you are fortunate. Sometimes in life, you have to be fortunate. And when I say I was fortunate, although I was scoring goals, there were a lot of there probably were a few three or four players ahead of me at the time. Um, but fortunately for me, they they were all injured, and I got drafted into Graham Taylor's squad, uh, and it was it was it was quite ironic because the first time I got drafted into the squad, I didn't play, but I was in the squad was um, when we played against the, the, the uh, against Turkey. Um, was my uh, my first call up, uh, and what you do, you just I think it gets rumoured uh, in the papers a lot that you know Les Ferdinand's playing well, scoring goals. He's got to be due an England call up, but you never think it's going to come. And then all of a sudden you get this this letter to the to the ground. You get a call from the, the ground, and they inform form the club that um, your your player is going to be selected for England duty, and so on and so forth. And um, again, another surreal moment in my life. You know, I mean, this is a kid out of a council estate um, from West London playing non-league football, and you get called up to to, to play for England. So um, that was my my first encounter. What did your dad say? Got to ask you. Yeah, my dad was. Uh, Cool. He was, he, he, you know, one of the things my dad, my dad was a, as a, as a growing up as a kid, he, he was an amateur bodybuilder. So my dad loved, loved the uh, bodybuilding, um, and everything he did, he did to, to, to the best that he could possibly do it. Yeah. And I always said that when I became a professional footballer, the, the highest accolade you could possibly get is to play for your country. Yeah. So that's where I've got to aim for. Um, that's where I want to be. That's where I've got to 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 try and take my career so I can play for England. And um, and I managed to do that. Yeah, it was England was probably disappointing for me because I, I felt because I was probably at QBR, um, didn't probably get the recognition I deserved as a yeah. player at back yeah. then. So going into play for England, every time I played, I always felt from the press and everybody else was this was my one and only opportunity. If I didn't do well in this game, I wasn't going to be picked again. Mm. Um, and that kind of like followed my, my England career. You know, you know, Alan Shearer talks about, I saw him talking about um, the other day where he went sort of like 19 games without scoring for England and was still first choice. Yeah. And I, and I would never, I would be never afforded that opportunity. Yeah. 17 times, five goals, Euro mm. 96. Goals. Yeah, that was probably the worst, the, the most disappointing time for me, Euro 96. Yeah. I come off, uh, you know, okay, Newcastle didn't win the league that year, but I came off the back of a very good season, 29 goals in all competitions, PFA P- PFA Player of the Year, voted by by uh, by your your compatriots, yeah, to be their best player that season and not playing a minute in Euro '96. Did you ever approach Terry Venables? Nah, I was like, um, I, the only thing I said to uh, uh, to uh, sub you to say, let me go in before the shootout. Did you? No, no. You know what? We when we we played Germany in that game, and always remember there was back then. You, you the the supporters were very close to 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 the dugouts. Yeah, very 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 close to to where we sat. And I remember some supporters shouting, "Get Ferdinand with twenty minutes to go." Venables, what are you doing? Get Ferdinand on. Get Ferdinand on. He, he'll he'll, he'll terrorise them. Get Ferdinand on. And he and I saw him go. He went like this, crossed his hands, and he went. In, in, in a thing of defiance and I thought there goes my chance I ain't never getting on now like yeah, once you've done that you know, no manager likes to be dictated to by the, no, by I, the supporters Rizal who actually 
you know, <laughs> unbelievable. This this lad who works for me as well is wearing a QPR shirt. He's been at Loftus <laughs> Road many times. Uh, at the first England game in Malaysia, 80 degrees, he's wearing the England kit, wearing <laughs> football boots, and he's standing to God save the Queen by the television <laughs> as though... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd seen it all. I posted it on Instagram. I'm like, what planet is this boy on? But he, he's like, and he, he adores you, Les. So I'm going to ask him. He's, he's got like 750 questions, but I'm going to let him ask it to two. So Rizal, over to you, my man. Hi, Les. It's an honor uh, talking to you at the moment and listening in to this podcast. So I've got a question mm. being the avid golfer I am myself personally. So footballers like yourself who retired and went into management and now into directorships are known to be good golfers. And I heard from Tony himself that you yourself are an avid golfer. So it's a two-part question. Number one, what would you say that you play off these days handicap-wise? And mm-hmm. what is your favourite golf course? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, He's a member of Lot Lomond, this man. Good morning. Good <laughs> afternoon. Um my handicap at the moment, and it's really strange. I, I took up golf when I was uh, around 40, 43 years of age. Uh, I didn't play while I was a footballer. Um, and the reason, simple reason was I was like, I used to argue with people. I was saying, I'm, I'm, I don't want to play a golf course because I'm less fair than I should be able to play a golf course because I'm a black man and I enjoy playing golf and I should be given afforded the same opportunity as everybody else. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but back in the day, there was golf courses that wouldn't allow blacks, wouldn't allow the Irish and wouldn't allow Jews. Uh, really? To play on them. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So um, I was like, I was very much, I was dead against golf for a very, very, very long time. Um, and it was only till I did a, I did a, a segment for a, a magazine called Golf Punk. Um, and he said, uh, you know, there's a, uh, there was a segment called Teach the, Teach the World to Swing. And then when I did the interview with the fella, I told him my reasons for not playing. And he said, don't you think you owe it to the younger generation to go out and show them that they can play golf courses if they're, 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 they're black and they enjoy the game? Um, he said, you know, why do you think Tiger Woods takes so much pleasure in pulling on the green jacket? It's to prove to everybody else that, you know, uh, he's capable and there's other black people that are capable of playing golf and should be allowed to afford the same opportunities. So that got me into playing. And I now play off... Uh, uh, a respectable seven handicap and um, my favourite golf course. I'm a member of uh, Loch Lomond, which I think is very, very picturesque. Uh, I love it. Um, but I played I played a golf course in um, Abu Dhabi called Yas Island. Uh, yeah. And um, I think that's, that's where the Formula probably, One track is. Yeah, where the Formula One track is. Yeah, correct. Um, um that's probably, yeah, Yas Marina is probably my, my favourite, one of my favourite courses. Although I played Glen Eagles PGA course the other day and that's probably the most picturesque golf course I've ever played in my life. The history yeah. adds on to the aura of the golf course because like exactly. how in the UK you have big events like the British Masters and all these other yeah. events, whereas... I can imagine the one in UAE, it's like the modern golf courses, but it's just yeah. something else altogether. Yes, exactly. Les, you've got to tell the audience. It, it, I was driving the other day and I just cracked up and the guy next to me said, why are you laughing? I said, I'm thinking of Les Ferdinand's Paul Gascoigne story. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in England. <laughs> First of all, tell us about Gazza. I mean, a special, a special, special player. Uh, and you've got you've got to tell that story about the one drink. Oh right, okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Gaza was like you know when, when when people talk to me, you know, one of the questions I'm sure some you ask today is who's the best player you've ever played with? Um, I say domestically probably uh, David Ginola was uh, you know he was a brilliant tactician, um, brilliant um, technique and everything else. So, but the one player that stands out for me more than anyone else is Gaza. Um, he was he was the best player I've, I've ever played with. You know, he, he, he had feet like velvet. He could do anything he wanted with the football. You know, he's just his lifestyle was just um, not conducive to playing football on a regular basis. Um, but he was the best. But um, the story about Gaza was uh, I always remember when I was when I was away <laughs> in England. Um, used to used to turn up on a on a Sunday. Um, if we had, if you had a game 
um, sort of like on a Wednesday, you 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 would have played for your team on a, uh, your, your your domestic team on a Saturday, and then you meet up with the England squad on a Sunday Sunday afternoon. And we used to get we used to get to we used to get together, and um, Graham Taylor would always come in and do a speech, welcome all the boys. Sometimes because the game is some some players played on a Sunday. Um, they would turn up later. They would turn up on the Monday, and um, it, it would come in, and he would tell us what the agenda was for the week, and basically what we would be doing on the Monday. Monday was normally the press day, so he would go and we we play these little games, and then and then um, once the press had gone, we'd go into to, to serious training. Um, so after each each uh, after he'd done his speech, he'd say, "Right, chaps, you can have a drink tonight, or you can have one drink, or you can have blah blah." So one day he comes in, he goes, "Right, we got we got a couple of games." So you're going to be able to, you can have all of you can have one drink. So um, a few of the guys went to the bar and they and they said to the they said to the barman, "Can I have a one second? Can I have a pint of lager? Can I one second? Can I have a pint of Guinness? Uh, you know, yeah, I'll have a pint of Guinness." All of a sudden, Gaza comes to the bar and he says, "Can I have a pint of brandy, please?" <laughs> so the barman says to him, Gaza, I can't give you a pint of brandy." And he looked across, he said, what are you drinking? To the other player, so he goes, oh, I've got a pint of Guinness. They so said, what are you drinking? He says, well, I've got a pint of lager. He says, well, I want a pint of brandy. <laughs> so the guy, the guy got the bottle of brandy and had to pour him a pint of brandy. And the only reason he did that was that he knew he could have more than one drink. He just stayed there all night, just chasing that, putting that into another glass and chasing it. But he would say, I only had one drink like everybody else. And Gaza was the only person in the squad that would have thought of that. So you've played with so many teams, like across London, you've played in QPR, you've played in Newcastle, Tottenham. So what would you say is the meanest rivalry that you've uh, in games that you've played in? Okay, what I mean is probably it's really strange because you know uh, we all know that um, uh, QBR Chelsea used to be a bit of a rivalry, um, or it used to be a strong rivalry. Uh, Tottenham and Arsenal was strong. I mean, the, the, the unfortunate for me when I went to when I went to Newcastle, the North East derby is usually really, 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 really tough. Um, Newcastle and Sunderland. But the only problem was when I played up there in the first season, they didn't allow away supporters in. That that's how bad it was. They oh, didn't allow wow. away supporters in, in in that particular game, home and away. Right. Um, and then the second season, they was um, uh, the second season they was uh, they they got relegated, so I, I didn't we didn't play against them. So that that was that would have been a big role. But I think the most the most hatred that goes between two teams that I've ever played for is uh, Tottenham West Ham. And I didn't realise the rivalry until I actually went to Tottenham. Um, top West Ham supporters absolutely hate hate <laughs> new, uh, hate Tottenham and vice versa. And I always thought it was it was Arsenal Tottenham, and you know it's a North London derby, so everybody goes. But, but there's a there's a real nastiness to the, the the hatred that West Ham have for for Tottenham and vice versa. There you go. And Les, <clears throat> you know you know as of today, actually I didn't realise it. My only 99 black players have played for England. I have mm. to cover, I have to cover, because you, you're in that period where I think, you know, um, for me, you know, I was a West Ham supporter. I was beaten up by Millwall fans. Um, you walk down West Ham now, they're all Bangladeshis now. But the, <laughs> those days, I was the only Indian going to Upton Park. And, and uh, you know, I've said football's moved a long, long, long way. You know, I remember Clyde Best, you know, yeah. that kind of stick he used to take. And he's a legend in my eyes. You know, I, 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 BBC did a TV program and asked me to comment about Clyde Best, who I thought was one hell of a gentleman, especially with what he had to put up with. But, um, you know, I mean, you know, we, we had the Anton Ferdinand and John Terry incident. Um, <clears throat> but even then I said football has, has made huge progress from when it was, when it was. But... You were in that period, in that transition period, and you know, and it wasn't easy, um, you know. And then in parts of Southeast Asia, we have our own forms of racism, etc. Um, not so much on the sports field, but uh, it wasn't easy, Les. And that, that's why I have even a higher respect for you because you were, you were class. You you never let it bother you. You always stood above it. Um, but 
you know, how do you think the game has progressed? And uh, I'm proud at QPR. It wasn't a conscious decision. It's just we, we didn't care what color anyone was. But, you know, we have you. We have Chris Ramsey. Right? You know, our board probably needs a white guy on the board. But that, <laughs> that wasn't – it's never been deliberate, right? It's just being the way it is. Um, but while players now are accepted, you still don't see a lot of managers – and coaches, um, you know, uh, and, and director of football, to be honest. I'm not sure if you're the only only black director of football out there at the moment. Um, but talk a little bit about how you think the game has progressed and what's holding back more Darren Moores. Um, I think, Tan, being honest with you, uh, as much as we believe it's progressed, I think what what we have seen is a political correctness in terms of the way people talk. Um, but I always say um, it's actions. You know, as, as, you, as you said, uh, you know, I, I say to people, I work for the most diverse football club in, 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 the, in this country in terms of giving people opportunities. Um, a lot of other people talk about it. RFA talk about it. Um, loads of people talk about it. But you just don't see former footballers afforded the same opportunities that their counterparts are, you know, and I, I you know, I often mention Steven Gerrard, I often mention Frank Lampard, I, Wayne Rooney, and because they're current, they're current, but we can go back to Steve Bruce's, um, we can go, you know, A.D. Boothroyd's and people like that who, you know, yes, you know, Steven Gerrard, Wayne Rooney, Frank Lampard have had exceptional careers and, it's almost a given that when they when they retire as footballers, they are going to be given opportunities as, as managers because of what they've done in their careers. And I've got no problem with that whatsoever, Time. I really have no problem mm. with that. All I say is why is the likes of uh, Paul Lintz, um, why is the likes of Sol Campbell, Patrick Vieira, Thierry Henry, all these players former players, very, very good players. And, and, and if you look at the, what they've achieved in their careers, have, have got as, as stellar careers of the guys that I mentioned earlier on, why are they never afforded the yeah, same opportunity? A, a brilliant you know, point, Liz. Brilliant point. The, 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 the press, as soon as these guys get to a stage where they're coming to the end of their careers, talk about what great manage they, they will make. They never talk about the Vieras. They never talk about the Campbells. They never talk about the Inches. They never talk about the, the, the Ferdinands as, as, as being great managers. So it's never put in anyone's foresight. And now we've, talk, we've spoken about, I've mentioned great players in terms of Lampard, Gerrard and, and Rooney. Let's go further afield. I mean, they, they, there's people that haven't even played that get they're getting better opportunities than the likes of Henri and, yeah. and people like that to to, to manage in, in this country. And I and I just think what we what we see at the moment is people being politically correct in what they're saying, mm. but I keep saying about the actions. You know, I had as you know, Tyne, I came out and um, with you with your guys blessing when we spoke about taking the knee. Yeah, you know, for many years, for thirty years, I've been talking about this discrimination in football. And we've worn badges, we've worn T-shirts, we've done, you know, kick it out, you know, all these, all these different things. And nothing's changed. I don't want to do any more gestures. I want actions. And action starts from the top. You go to the FA, there's no person of colour in any position of prominence at the FA. So how are they going to be, deal with racist problems? And I try to understand it from FIFA, UEFA. I go, all, I go through all of the, the, these organisations and I say, if there's a racist problem, you know, that's happened in, in the crowd, if you have no idea of, 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 of being racially abused, how do you set the punishment? Mm. Yeah. You're just assuming and you're just, you're just thinking you have no one there that can tell you and give you information about how it feels, what it's done. You know, people often say to me, you know, um, and sometimes you have to, you, you have to get as, uh, as real as this because people say to me, oh, this one's been called ginger. This one's been called fat. This one's been called abused by this, 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 and this. And I said, the connotations are very different. I said, because no one's been hung because they've been ginger. No one's been hung because they've been fat. Black people got killed just because they were black and they still continue to get killed because just because they're black. So the connotations are very, very different. And this is what you guys need to understand and you don't. But, you know, like I said, it starts at the top. And if we're not making no differences at the top, doesn't feel it's way down. And I'll tell you another Les, Les Ferdinand story. 
you know, as director of football in QPR, we're we're having a horrific season. I, I'm there with my future wife, and <laughs> I think we lost. And there's a fan abusing me. I mean, really abusing me. Like it's, I can't repeat even what he's saying. <laughs> And he, he takes his membership card out and throws it to me and says, that's what I think of you. And, and I, you know, Chloe's in a state of shock. She's never seen an Englishman screaming and ranting and raving. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we delicately walk out and Les goes out and has a chat with him and, and, and tells him off, actually. And at the end of it, he says to Les, um, can you pass my card back? <laughs> <laughs> Because he threw it, it went over the wall. Yeah, correct. He threw it well, uh, went over the wall. But that, that is amazing. You know, football is amazing. I, for me, you know, that day I'll never forget was when we won against Derby and you have 45,000 fans singing your name and then roll over a few years later and you have people throwing cards at you and yeah. wanting to lynch you. But it is, it is an incredible game. But I want to tell everyone that how proud I am of Les of keeping calm and cool through lots of managers, lots of players and lots of highs and lows. But, you know, we're, we're, we're on our way. And Les mentioned about Grenfell and, you know, when Grenfell happened, which was, a, for those of you who don't know, a massive fire where many people were killed in the place that he lived. Uh, you know, I called them. I, I instantly said, open up the stadium and uh, provide shelter and take in goods. And obviously QPR, I think, have done an incredible job in the community, which Les has been a big part of. And we had this game, a charity game, which uh, the, the CBS, um, or Sony actually, shows you my age, Sony and our director um, asked me whether I, he would do it, we would do it, of course we did it, it was a fantastic success, I mean it was a huge success. But Les Ferdinand came on um, just after Jose Mourinho, who <laughs> was, Jose Mourinho, he came on and, and uh, you know, the ball came to him. He did an amazing turn, a fantastic shot. Didn't score. It was. It was. I thought, wow, he still got it in him. And then he limped off. <laughs> <laughs> he he spent about thirty five seconds. He came on to great applause. Everyone's out. Like, Les is there. He takes the ball coolly. I mean, did take it coolly. Turned it. It was a very quick turn. I was impressed. Someone, put, and he, <laughs> you know, I think Mo Farah. Someone passed it to you, and you turned it. And I thought, wow. And then he stopped and then and had to come off limping off. <laughs> yeah, what basically happened there was like, um, as you said, uh, I was impressed with the turn and everything else. My, yeah. my Achilles just wasn't a, a, a impressed with it. And, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I ripped my Achilles. But um, Which, yeah, no, what you guys did on the, on the day and, you know, what you did for, for, for Grenfell and we continue to do for Grenfell is, is, is amazing time. And yeah. Um, um, uh, it made me very, very pl- proud to be part of Queens Park Rangers um, and, and what you guys do and what you what you guys do for the community, and and you know one of the special things of the day, and and, and you know when you when when you when you think about a day and how you want it to be, it couldn't have been any better, um, and the, the and and what what tells me that is that when I went to speak to the some of the victims that were were, were at the stadium on the day. They turned around and they said they've had nothing to smile about over 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 a period of time, um, and this is the first time that they've had a smile on their face. And for me, that was that 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 said everything it needed to say. You know, why people saying to me, "I never come to football, but I came to this because I wanted to support QBR and, and the community." And uh, and I think we 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 gained a load of fans, and that wasn't the reason why we no, were doing it. No. But we gained a lo- we gained a load of fans and respect from people for what for what the club. And you and the guys have done for, for, for Brentford. How much do you spend on clothes? I've got to say, Les Ferdinand must be the best dressed of <laughs> anyone in the footballing world. Um, is that a big part of your life, Les? Shopping? It used to be. It used to be. I, I, um, I used to. I used uh, to do you have a, a. I've never been to your house. You never invited me because you're an antisocial sod, but. You know, uh, you don't come out of London yeah. when you come when you come to England. You don't go out. You don't know if you watch that Ameri- uh, that um, movie, American Gigolo. Richard Gere opens up his cupboard, and there's like you know h- h- hundreds of suits in different colours, all, all arranged. I kind of imagine your closet to be a little bit like that. Is it? No, <laughs> it's very nicely. It's very nicely arranged. Uh, it's very tidy. Um, 
<laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, listen. I, I, obviously, when I was when I was growing up, I loved. Um, uh, I still love clothes. I still like. Uh, I suppose I like look, being presentable. You know, my best friend uh, Naze Razak had prostate cancer. Les has done loads. In fact, it's helped Naze on, on prostate cancer. It's it's really important because people don't realize it and raising the awareness. If you think of how much money you spent on breast cancer, um, yeah. it's another form of discrimination. Actually, you know, male. Uh, diseases never get as much attention and Les has done a whole lot to, to raise awareness of that. Do you want to say something about that, Les? Yeah, no, you know, it's it's, it's something that's been prevalent in my, in my family as well. So, I'm, you know, my granddad, uh, when he passed, he passed. That was part of the reason he passed. Um, my dad's had prostate cancer. I've had uncles who, who've got it. Uh, and so, um, it, you know, I've always, it, it's, you know, unfortunately, one in eight men get prostate cancer, and one in four black men get prostate cancer. So it's pretty prevalent in it in the Afro Caribbean community. So, yeah. um, and it's something that years ago was never never talked about. Um, and I think it's something that needs to be brought, brought to the fore. I think we need to, you know, um, because especially nowadays it, it, it can be cured. So yeah. the sooner that the sooner that it's it, it's, it's, about it's detection. diagnosed, the sooner that you, you take yourself to the hospital. If there's any any problems down there, the better the better your chances are of survival and um in getting rid of it. So um yeah, it's it's important that we do keep, as you said, keep raising awareness and um, making people weary of the plight. Yeah, no, it's great that you've given your time to this as well, amongst all the millions of other things you did. Quick fire question: toughest defender you ever faced against? Tony Adams. Best manager. That quick enough, boy. Well, that was quick. Best, ma- best manager? Jerry Francis. Who's the best Ferdinand player to be in the Premier League? Sorry, who's the best player that's ever been in the Premier League? No, who's the best Ferdinand? Les Anton Rio. Uh, that's tough. I mean, because if you looked at it, you'd go, right, Rio, because he's he's, he's won all the awards. But he was a defender. Yeah. You know I mean, it's harder to put the ball in the back of the net than it is to stop it. So. <laughs> Any superstitions before a game? Do you know what? When I was younger, I used to. I used to always wear, you know, the slips that they give to us. I always used to wear them the, the inside out. I used to wear them the wrong way around. Um, I think that might have just been more for hygiene than it was a superstition. <laughs> time, do you know I mean? Best striker? Ronaldo number nine. There you go. Nine T- Ronaldo. Toughest goalkeeper? Michael, worst fans. I mean, int- intimidating as a, as an away as an away team. That really kind of spooked you. Probably Millwall. Yeah. Favorite black player apart from Paul Ince. Favorite black player would have to be. Oh, there's a combination there. Um, I love John Barnes. I think it would have to go to sort of like Cyril Regis or the late Laurie, Ka- Laurie Cunningham because uh, those were the guys. Oh, Laurie Cunningham. Brendan Batson. Yeah, well, Brendan, Brendan Batson. Batson would have to be in there because they, they were the ones that inspired me. Favourite country in the world? St. Lucia. Favourite food? Although I, although I spend a lot of time in Malaysia. <laughs> Lankari. I we, like Lankari. We miss you. Uh, best, best meal? Oh, Caribbean. Ah, oh, that's surprising. I don't even know what Caribbean food is. Tell us quickly. Can you see that picture? Oh boy, yeah. Oh, is, that, is that Pele? It is. Yes, is that it. you? Yes. Oh wow. <laughs> what was he giving you? I mean, apart from a he kiss, can, he, he's giving me the PFA Player of the Year award. The, the year you won it. Yeah, and I, and I had to say to him, mate, calm down a little bit. I'm not into all this <laughs> kissing and stuff. Yeah, man, but, uh, <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Just, just. I mean, digression. Like, tell us about Caribbean food. Um, it's just where I grew up. It's what I enjoy. So what is it? Um, I actually don't know. I mean, sorry? I don't actually. Creole. So like, you, you never had jerk chicken. You never had no. uh, stew chicken or anything like no. that. Oxtail. You never. Oh, you don't know what okay. you're missing. So. When, when, when we come over, what's the best Caribbean restaurant in in the UK? At the moment, I don't. I don't even know. I'm not allowed out. I, I go to a yeah. takeaway called. Um, uh, Blue Mountain in Halsden. Oh, okay, not far from us. One stop as well. One stop's very good. Yeah, okay. Halsden, very good. All right, you're taking me there next. We'll get some. We'll get some free food because one of the one of the, the, the woman that owns it, her son was in the academy. I call Les Bang because we went for a kebab once. It, 
No, uh, where uh, man? What was it? I'll tell you where we went. Uh, we okay. went to you. You met this your, uh, mate of yours or friend of yours who owned a burger place, and he said it was the best burgers. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. It was the best burgers in the whole of the UK. Yeah, yeah. He said, okay. So we, we we went off to this place and we sat down and he said, oh, I'm going to order this cup for you. I'm going to order this cup for you and this cup and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we had the burger and we was like, okay. And we had a chat and we was all right side. And he went, yeah, that was really nice, wasn't it? I said, yeah, that was all right. Yeah. I said, do you want me to order you? And I said, no, no, that's enough. And then we, we, <laughs> we got in the car afterwards and he went to eat. What did you think of that burger? I went, Bang average. <laughs> <laughs> you said, yeah, I thought the same as yeah. well. Then <laughs> we keep calling each other bang. Yeah, since then we'd be calling you a bang. What do you want to be remembered for? Um, what do I want to be remembered for? Um, I think I always want to be remembered for being who I was, never changing from who I was. Funniest player. Player you most, who made you laugh the most. <laughs> that's tough there's been someone but probably um, Alan McDonald the late Alan McDonald who was who was captain here at QPR oh well he's, um, he's uh, we named a plane after him I didn't know he was yeah. funny yeah he was he was one of the funniest people I did have come across in my, yeah. in my time in football thoughts on Harry Redknapp thoughts on Harry Redknapp yeah Harry was um, how the best way for me to put this <laughs> I thought Harry was very good at putting putting teams together. Mm. Um, one of the most charismatic um, people I've ever come across in football. Les, look, it's been an honour. It's been a pleasure. And I mean, obviously, we're going to see each other a lot more. And I'm looking forward to this season. Are you looking forward to this season? I certainly am. Boys, yeah. the first day back in today. And uh, I've missed most of it. But I wanted <laughs> to see them sort of like coughing their guts up. Because I've yeah. done that for 20 odd years, Tony. And I take great pleasure in seeing other people do it now. So. You're a gentleman. And uh, I look forward to seeing you. I miss you dearly. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun. Have a good one. Make sure we you get too, promoted. To see you soon. And see you soon. And, Take care. Thanks to everyone for, for listening in and to the guys for their questions. Thanks, Cheers, mate. Take care. Cheers. See you, Bang. Take care. Take care. Cheers, Bye.